Uh, OK, so uh, in the previous week, uh, what we were talking about is curve fitting. And curve fitting is a, obviously a very important aspect of things we want to do. It's one of the first data analysis techniques. And most of the stuff that we did in curve fitting actually involved towards the end there was thinking about doing minimization of error. And ultimately, this is all about optimization. And so part of what we're going to spend the next week talking about is this idea of optimization. Um, optimization sort of has a lot of intuitive concepts associated with it. And part of what we want to do is start thinking about algorithms that can do perform this functionality for us. Okay, you have a system, and what you would like it to do is perform in an optimal manner. Well, what does optimality mean? Typically, what you think about when you think about optimization, one of the first things you've got to think about is, what am I actually trying to optimize? Then there's this idea of what's called an objective function. Everything revolves around this. The objective function is the object that you're trying to figure out how to maximize or minimize. Okay? So if you're a Wall Street guy uh, or gal, Opt the objective function might be, you know, basically how much profit you're clearing from a, let's say, a trading strategy that you might have cooked up. And what you'd like to do is cook that strategy up, use your parameters in that system in order to maximize profit. Okay, so this is a very intuitive idea. And the objective function is something that you would construct or that you would know as an expert in the loop of a problem how to construct some kind of objective function. There's a couple other concepts that would go with this. One is the idea of what's called feasibility. It's OK to say there's an objective function, but feasibility is important because what feasibility allows you to do is say, look, there may be a way to, in fact, optimize this function, but you have to constrain this problem to feasible solutions. Could be that the kind of dials or kind of controls you have in your system have some limits. And so there's a feasibility region that you might want to think about for doing this objective function. Or, said another way, you have constrained versus unconstrained optimization techniques. Of course, constraints is just like the name implies. Uh, you have constraints on your system. These can be things that are physically realistic, realistic con constraints that basically narrow your feasibility regions. Or you could just say, there's no constraints. I just want to find the optimal of some objective function, and I can take on any value that I possibly want. So let's try to frame this now. Uh, from a mathematical perspective and write down the problem at hand. So what we want to think about is some function. Let me do it here. It's a function of a vector field. And what we'd really like to do, we can always recast this as trying to find the minimum of this function. Okay, That's going to be the way we're going to start thinking about it. Take some objective function, find its minimum. If you're trying to maximize something, it's just the negative of the minimum. Okay, So it doesn't matter. Minimum of f of x. With a certain number of variables, where x is comprised of you know, x1, x2, x3, xn. So in other words, this function here depends upon all these variables that I can change. And so what I want to do is, well, what are, what are all these values that I have to pick so that this thing is minimized? Okay. These are called the control variables. So I have some control variables. I have this objective function. And my job is to figure out how to minimize that. And what are some techniques that you can use to do this? Okay. So what does it mean to be a minimum? This is said to have a minimum if I can find an x naught. So I can find some x, which is x naught, where 
f x is greater than or equal f of x naught for all x in some region. Okay, so that's what it means to be a minimum. So I look at all my x values, and if I can find this x naught, so that this thing is always smaller or equal to than the f of x for the whole region of interest. And by the way, this is where you can impose even constraints here. You know, this region could be all of space or all for you know all values of x one between negative infinity and infinity, or it could be that your region is actually constrained. Thus, you would have feasibility and constrained optimization issues to work with. So it's called. The, that's our basic, our optimization problem framed in the most uh, sort of general way. Okay. So the idea today is to start thinking about some simple, so I'm going to introduce two methods today, which are simple, op, simple optimization techniques um, for a, a function of a single variable and trying to find how to, in fact, find minimal solutions for that case. Okay, so the first one we want to talk about is called the golden section search. By the way, these methods I'm introducing, uh, they're kind of just these very basic techniques. It's not clear that you would use them so much in practice, but part of the, the idea is to start seeing how they might actually work. In fact, they're very uh, constrained in many cases. Uh, to, uh, to, you know, a small set of, uh, of, 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 of applications. So for instance here, we're going to take a one degree of function f of x, so it's just a simple f of x function, uh, and I'm going to assume it's unimodal. In other words, it has only a single uh, minima or local minima. Okay, so let me draw a, an example of something. Maybe it's a function that looks like this. Something like this. In other words, you can't have another minima here and here. This is the only minima in the whole problem. Okay? And what I'd like to do is develop an algorithm that comes down and finds this point right here. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about here is in this optimization, obviously you could look at this and say, why don't I just find where the derivative of zero? And in fact, there's ways to do this. So for instance, in newton raphson search. What this is going to be are what are called derivative-free methods. So obviously, when we think about derivatives, the whole idea behind a derivative being set to 0 is that you find a minimum or a maxima. Here we're going to talk about techniques that don't rely on finding the derivative to get you the solution. Okay? So I'm going to give you two derivative free methods and we're going to go from there. So this is going to work a lot like bisection. I'm going to pick a range of values for which I know the minimum sits in there. So for instance, I could say, hey, you know what? This minimum sits somewhere here between A and B. So what I'm going to do is start looking in that region in some kind of algorithmic way to try to converge to that point. Okay? So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to tip, pick two. So I have A, I have B. I'm going to pick two new things, x1 and x2, where x1 is bigger than A and less than x2, and x2 is less than B. Okay? And I'm going to evaluate this function f of x at this point x1 and x2. So let me just maybe pick here, x1, here, x2. And what I'm going to do is the following statement. Oop, let me try to pick these slightly different to help with us a little bit. Let me just make it a little crooked so. Let's just say that's where my point was. OK, so what I'm going to do is ask the following question. If f of x1, so what does this mean? Here's f of x1. It's less than f of x2. 
then what I know for sure is that the minimum sits over there. Okay? So in other words, I can say, it's just like bisection. Remember, bisection was about take the interval, cut it in half, ask the question, am I above or below, and then keep one half of the interval here. I'm going to do these cuts. I'm going to say, look, if this f1 is, f x1 is over here, then I know I can work in this interval and do the same cut again. Okay? Then, if that's the case, then you retain the interval x in an interval a to x2. Okay, so now you're in this interval, a to x2. However, if the opposite is true, if x1 was greater than f of x2, which isn't the case here, but if that was the case, then what you'd do is do the opposite. You'd say then you retain the interval x goes from x1 to b. Those are your two choices. If you program this up, you have if statements, right? You're going to ask, if this is true, do that. If that's true, do this. So the question comes, how do I want to pick x1 and x2? And in particular, what you'd really like to do to make this computationally efficient is when you go to the new interval, you'd like to recycle points as much as possible so you don't have to do new computations. Every time you do a new evaluation, it costs you something. So you'd like to be able to reuse your computed points uh, in, in this calculation. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that the size of the interval, when we want to do this reduction factor, the reduction factor at every step is constant, the factor of reduction. So when I think about the new interval, the new interval you think here is going to be, what is the reduction factor if I do this or if I do that? The reduction factor here could be c is equal to, in this case here, it's x2 minus a over b minus a. Okay? That's if I were to pick this interval. That is the total reduction. This is the percent in some sense of how much I've cut it down. But if I had picked the other interval, c would be b minus x1, b minus a. By the way, from here, I can get a value of x2. So this is how I'd pick x2. 1 minus c, a plus cb. And this is how I'd pick x1. x1 is equal to ca plus 1 minus cb. So just solve for x1 here, solve for x2 there, and look at that. It tells me x2 and x1 are, but by the way, I don't know what c is yet. But I do know if I had c, I could get x2 and x1. So in other words, you give me an interval, I cut it. Now that becomes, let's say, the new a here and the new b here, and then I pick new x1, new x2. Cut it, cut it, cut it. And what I hope to do is to converge down to that point right there. Okay. So let's make some observations here. So this is kind of what we want to start doing. And let's build from there. So let me erase this. OK, let's make an assumption. If f of x1 is less than f of x2, then the new interval right, that we just drew over there is this interval. It's x is in a to um, x2, right? So that's in that graph. F1 is less than, so what I'm going to do is shrink the interval this way. Okay? Uh, so the idea then is to say, well, look, uh, my x2 nu then is my, what my old x1 was. Okay? And my x1 old was equal to, I have the formula over there, it's Ca plus 1 minus C times b. 
Okay? And by the way, here's how I'm thinking about this. I want to reuse this point. So this is the other, this is why this is true. So when I do this cut, whatever this point is, you see this x1 that's here? I want to reuse that value. So in other words, I want this to be the new x2 and have a new x1 over here. So this would be, sorry, I drew this wrong on the bottom. If I cut it this way, I want this to be the new x2 and I want to have a new x1 over here. So I want the x, the new, so when I do this cut, the old x1 becomes the new x2, and then all I have to do is calculate a new x1 from here. And then I have a, and then I have the b. So b, a, x1, x2. And when I do the cut again, I want to recycle points. See, the only reason I'm doing this is so I don't have to recompute what this value is. I already did it. So let me use it again here as the f of x2. So that's what this says. The new x2 is the old one. And by the way, it's right over there what this is. But it is also true that the new x2 is given by this. And that's from the second formula over there, or the first formula over there. So this, this comes from the first formula over there. This comes from uh, the second formula over there. OK? But by the way, um, these are supposed to be the same. So let's go with x2 old, by the way. So let's put this in here. I have 1 minus c, a plus c times uh, x2 old is 1 minus c, a plus cb. OK. But this, these two are supposed to be the same, right? I, I kind of got these by, here's the recycling idea. Recycle the point, but here's x2 new, which is just here's how you get the new point by computing this c. It's related to c. So I got this one way. I got this another way by recycling. And these better be the same. You want to make this equal to this. Now when you do this, what you end up with, if you do the algebra, it looks a little bit painful because you have to set this equal to this, just move things around. But it turns out it comes out to be quite nice. It's this. quadratic formula for C. And then you can get the roots of this. C is equal to minus 1 plus square root of 5 all over 2. Now remember, there's a plus and a minus root. We're only going to take the positive root because it only makes sense for this factor to be positive. So we throw away the negative root. This was what C is. And by the way, this value here is 0.6180 which looks a lot like the golden ratio, which is this. This constant C then, the golden ratio is 1 plus C, or it's 1.618. The golden ratio is this very special number uh, that pops up all over the place in, in all kinds of application areas. And this is called the golden ratio, this number here, this 1.618 and so forth. That number is very important. And it pops up directly here just by simply recycling points and changing the interval. So this tells you how you should pick these cuts. So when we come over here, there was this idea of saying, I have A and B. I have X1 and X2. And by the way, I get X1 and X2 right by here. I didn't know what C was, but I got C by imposing the fact that I want to recycle points. And I want a constant cut per time. And this just gives me an algorithm for calculating the new x1 and x2. So I ask the question, am I below or above? I shrink the interval. This now becomes a. That becomes b. The new x1 and x2 are calculated here. We move on. And in fact, we can recycle the old, the old x1 becomes x2, or the old x2 becomes x1. So that is the golden section search, how you basically write this thing up. And what you're going to do is basically put this in an iteration pattern. And look what's going to happen. Let me try to draw graphically what might happen in a case like this. 
And you know, it's only going to be a rough sketch, partly because it is hard to draw exactly the staying. But I want to just show you what happens at each iteration. And let me take this function, actually, let me try to draw this function here again. Let's take A and B. And what I'm going to do is have an x1 and an x2. So on the first iteration, I generate my x1 and x2 from there by using C is this golden ratio piece. So there we go. I do this. I evaluate. Is f of x1 bigger than x2 or smaller than x2? If it's smaller than x2, then I know I'm over on this side. So now my interval becomes this. And this a stays a. The x2 here becomes b. This x1 becomes x2. And now I have a new x1 over here. Something like that. Then you say, OK, where am I now? Is f of x1 bigger than x2 or smaller than x2? Right? So which one's bigger? Oh, this is bigger, so I know I'm over in this regime. So now this becomes a, b. This becomes x1, and then x2 is over here somewhere. See, I recycled this point. I asked the question. Which one's bigger, f of x1 or f of x2? Oh, this one's bigger, so I know I'm in this regime over here. This becomes now a, b. This becomes x1. And then I have a new x2. And see how I'm just kind of working on converging. You keep doing this, and this thing will converge down eventually to right there. OK, that's the golden section search. It's like bisection, but it's a little faster. You know, uh, it's quite a nice little methodology. OK? Uh, if we have time, I will go through the code that we have. There's a code in the notes that develops this fully. OK? And it actually implements this algorithm and converges to uh, a solution problem. And we might, we'll probably get to this in just a little bit. OK, so let's golden section search. Notice I didn't use any derivative information. OK? No derivative information. A lot of optimization routines try to use derivative information. In fact, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about gradient descent, which is really a completely derivative-based method. But here, no derivatives were calculated anywhere. Right? This is just simply evaluate the function, figure out how to move next. That's it. No functions, no, no derivatives. OK. So that's one method. Now I want to cover a second method uh, that is a derivative-free method, which is called successive parabolic inter interpolation. By the way, you can always ask, why am I doing uh, derivative-free methods? Well, there's a lot of times when you have a function that we're trying to calculate an objective function for, you don't have its function form, right? You, don't, you can't write it down. Maybe you're getting the information from an experiment, and you don't have the functional form to calculate a derivative for it. But with methods like this, you can still simply keep cutting it down to find the best solution, even if you don't know what f of x actually is, except you just have data for it. Okay? So there's a, there's a lot of uses for derivative-free methods. Moreover, derivatives are actually very tricky to calculate sometimes numerically, which you'll find out about uh, next week. So let's talk about successive parabolic approximations. Here's what we're going to do. Consider a function. Here's, you know, I'm making up some function here. And I would like to find the minimum of this. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick three points. And what I'm going to do with those three points is draw a parabola through those three points. The best, OK? 
So I have three points. A parabola is ax squared plus bx plus c. It has three unknowns. So I can draw a parabola through those. So let's say this is the parabola here. OK? I, I'm just kind of sketching this out, how this might work. And by the way, how would I get the equations for that parabola? Because I've picked these points here, x1, x2, x3. So I can certainly evaluate f of x1, f of x2, f of x3. And in doing so, I can write down some polynomial function, p of x, which is f of x1. And if you remember here, what I'm going to use here is my Lagrange coefficient formula to express this parabola. Because this is a very fast way to do it. I don't have any equations to solve. Write it down. There it is. Remember from the polynomial formula, you put in your y values and then you write down your Lagrange coefficient. There it is. So, in other words, when you're at x1, this is x1 minus x2, x1 minus x3, and this all becomes 1. When you're at x1, that's 0, that's 0. All this drops out, this becomes 1, you just get f of x1. When you're at x2, these become, that becomes 0, that becomes 0, they drop out, this becomes x2 minus x1 x3, x2 minus x3, this becomes 1, you just get this. Similarly for f of x3, when you're at x3, those all go to 0, this goes to 1, you're just left with f of x3. So I can write this parabola down fairly simply, just using this formula. And there's the parabola. Now here's what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is take this thing, this parabola, and I'm going to look for where is the minimum of that parabola. Okay, well the minimum, uh, so notice what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to differentiate f of x, so it's still derivative free in the sense that I'm not differentiating f of x, but I am going to differentiate p. So I'm going to look for when the minimum happens, which is p of x naught equals 0. In other words, take the derivative of all this, find the x naught where this thing is 0. And by the way, you can do that, and x naught has a, it's a complicated formula, but let me write it down. You are welcome to do the algebra, and I'm sure many of you will stop this video right now and work this all out just for fun, because who wouldn't want to work this out for fun? All right. Let me write it all out. All right, you evaluate that. There it is. There's that's where the derivative is, is zero. Okay, I did it, but I don't feel necessarily the need to do it again. But since you may have not done it, maybe you feel compelled to derive that again, or to derive it once. Where is this point? Where, if you look here, it's uh, it's right around here. That's this x naught. Now what's the key? The key now is to just simply recognize, OK, so uh, what do I want to do with this? I want to look at the relationship between x0 and x2. Is x0 to the left or to the right of x2? OK? Let's make this assumption first. What if x2, x0 is less than x2? Right? So it's to the left here. So then what I'm going to do is say the following. If that's true, I'm going to say that my new x1 is just my old x1. In other words, I'm going to keep this as my x1, my left point. I'm going to make my x0 my new x2, right? Remember, x1, x2, x3, x2 is the middle point. That's going to be my new middle point. So my new x2. This is going to be x naught. 
And then I'm going to take this last point and make x2 the right point. So I'm going to say x3 new is the old x2. That's it. So uh, if I want to think about that's that's kind of the idea that what you want to do. So think about what this is going to be now. So now you're going to say, OK, let me get my new three points. My new three points then are, this will be x1, this will be x2, this will be x3 in the next iteration. So this is k equals 0, the first iter this is now the first iteration in. This is x1, x2, x3. Now let me draw the three points. One, two, three. Let me draw this parabola now in red. We got some other colors here because it's going to get, it's going to get, it's going to get crazy. I want the parabola that goes through these three points now. So now let's let's draw them in blue so you can color it. Up. So now maybe my parabola is like this. Okay, I don't know. I'm drawing, trying to draw the parabola as I can. It's okay. This, there's the new x1, x2, x3. Now, think about what you do. Find the minimum of this thing. Well, it kind of looks like it's about here. OK, that's my new x0 for this thing. So you say, OK, if that's there, this is going to become my new x2, my new x3, and that's going to be my x1 in the second iteration. You get that all red? So now my parabola through these points And the idea is that you're going to converge down to the bottom of this thing. You know, it's hard to do with just colored pins. I'm sure if I, get, if I had green or purple, I would probably got it exactly right. But with blue and red, what can you expect? Not, you know, can't expect much. So that's the idea. You, keep, you take this parabola, and you keep making successive parabolas with this goal of basically keep calculating this x naught where this minimum is, just by this formula. Calculate it. Ask, is it to the left or right? It's to the left. Now you just move your boundary, move your boundary. Remember, all these methods are just move your boundary, move your boundary, move your boundary. Keep moving it until you squeeze into this point right there. Okay? And then at some point you just stop. You just say, oh, you know what? I got close enough. I've converged. I'm done. Okay? That is how you might do this. Now, by the way, there is an algorithm in MATLAB. We're going to start programming here, some of this in MATLAB here in a second. But the one thing I will point to you is a command called uh, fminbd. OK? Uh, this is a uh, search algorithm for minimization. So the fmin stands for minimization. And what this thing does is some kind of, it's a combination of both successive parabolic interpolation and golden search. Okay? So you tell it a function, and you tell it the interval to look in, and it will use some combination of these two methods, successive parab uh, parabolic approximation or the golden search, to go find you the solution for a 1D problem. Okay? So there is something built in, but let's go ahead and program something up ourselves. I think it's good to sort of illustrate how these might work from direct coding. So now let's, uh, let's think about what we want to do. Uh, in this code here, what do we want to do? If you're going to do successive parabolic uh, interpolation, you're going to give me a function. You're going to give me three points. And once I have the three points, you're going to have an if statement. And the if statement's going to work the following way. You're going to come into this thing. You're going to iterate. You're going to have a for loop on this whole thing. And the for loop's going to just start cutting through making you new parabolas every time. And what you want to do is basically say, look, let me go calculate x0. There it is. So I need to know the value of f of x1, f of x2, f of x3. Once I have them, I can compute x0. And then by computing x0, I can say, well, x0 is here. Where's the function? OK, and then I asked. All I got to do is say, OK, I can get that function value. But really what I want to do is just say, is x0 to the left or to the right of x2? If it's to the left, Make, switch everything like this. If it's to the right, switch it that way. Just move the boundaries. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Here's the algorithm, right? x1 new is the old. It's right there. And if x0 
is bigger than x2, you get something similar where you're moving this boundary over this time. That's it. And you just keep going until what? Well, until this x0 basically gets so close to the minimum that you stop, that you maybe put an a, a if statement there saying if my thing is sort of at the bottom, it's saying stop, stop. Okay? What about golden section search? Golden section search is going to be an algorithm. And right away, you see the if statement right there. You're going to have an A and a B. I already know what C is now, right? So we calculated what C is. So all I have to do is say, OK, I have an A and a B interval. I have a function. I calculate x1 and x2. And I evaluate, is this true or is this true? If this is true, I move the boundary this way. Now I have a new A and a B, recompute. If this is true, move the boundary the other way, recompute. Keep going, keep going, keep going till what? Until I squeeze this thing in and until I reach sort of the minimum. Okay? They're actually pretty simple things to start thinking about. So let's go program this up so that you can see how to implement something like this, how this optimization might work. Okay. Here. All right. So here we are, back with MATLAB, back for more fun. Um, so I got my MATLAB function here, and let's let's make up a function that we want to find the minimum of uh, to begin with. Uh, so let me uh, make up a function. So let's say x goes from. Uh, I don't know, uh, in the interval, so let's go negative 2, steps of 0.1 to 1. And my function is going to be the following. x to the fourth plus 10 times x dot times sine x dot squared. And that's it. And then let's plot x, f. OK. So here's the function. See that function? I just made that up. But here's what I'm looking for. See that point right there? That's my minimum. And I want an algorithm to go find it for me. OK? So, and I wanted to, obviously, like I said, here I could compute the derivative directly, but uh, we're going to actually just try to show how this derivative free method will work. OK, so I have that function. I'm trying to calculate that point. So my a will be negative 2. My b will be 1. Those are the two boundaries. Uh, C, remember, is how we're going to cut this thing, is negative 1 plus square root of 5 there, all divided by 2. If you remember, that was that coefficient of 0 0.610, whatever it was, happened to be. OK. So uh, first thing we need to do is compute x1 and x2 and the values of f1 and f2. So x1, if you remember from our formulas, is c times a plus 1 minus c times b. And x2 itself is 1 minus c um, times a plus c times b. OK, so that is my x1 and my x2. I also need f of f of x, f, f f evaluated at x1 and f evaluated at x2. Let's call those f1, f2. And I'm going to go ahead and basically copy and paste this here uh, and basically put in here x1, x1, x1. And by the way, since it's a single point, I can take away these dots because that's for ve ve a matrix multi a vector multiplies, which is component by component. Let's do it here, x2, x2. X2. Now, I'm not claiming this is the most efficient code, but it gets the job done, and that's all we really care about right now. So there we go. I start off with my x1, my x2, my f1, f2, and now I'm in business. Now I'm ready to start a loop for j equals 1 to, like, let's go through this thing uh, 100 times, let's say, end. So how do we want to do this? So the first question we have to ask is a very simple question. Is f1 bigger than f2? That's it, right? That's what I just showed on the board. That it, it, It's as simple as that. You're going to ask, is f1 bigger than f2? 
And if f1 is bigger than f2, then I have to move my boundary, my left boundary over. If f1 was less than f2, I'd have to move my right boundary over. Okay? So f1 is if f1 is bigger than f2, then what I'm going to do is say b is equal to x2. x2 is equal to x1. And f2 is equal to f1. So notice what I did here. I recycled my values of f2, of f1 and x1 when I move, made this move. Okay? Oh, sorry. This should be if, sorry, that should be that. If f1 is less than f2. Sorry about that. Right? So if f1 is less than f2, I'm moving my right boundary over. So here, I'm moving my, my b, which is my right, my right boundary, is now x2. And my x2 is that I had before uh, is now going to be what my old x1 was. Now, the order you do this in is very important. First, you want to replace b, and then you overwrite x2. Don't do this one first, because it'll overwrite x2 with x1, which then would write x1 as b. Okay, that was screwed up pretty badly. I need to compute a new x1. c times a plus 1 minus c times b. I need a new f1. I can just copy and paste right here. All right. Done. But else, if f1 is not less than f2, then it means uh, f1 is bigger than f2 or equal to f2. And then what I got to do is move my left boundary to the right, which means a is going to be equal to x1 now. x1 is going to be equal to x2 and f1 is equal to f2. And x2 now is equal to, well, I can just copy and paste this here, and f2 now, I can just copy and paste this here. And I need an end there. So there it is. It's as simple as that. This whole code right here, just simply this one here, all it's going to do is move um, if, if, if f1 is less than f2, it's going to move the boundary, the right boundary over. It's going to move the left boundary over. And you're ready to go again. Now you go through another iteration, right? Because after you come out of here, you go through the loop again. And you keep moving the boundary to try to converge. Now, we could let this thing go through 100 times. Or we could just decide here's the following. What does it mean to converge? What are B and A? Let's go back up to the board real quick. If we look over here on the board, I have this interval. A and B are the two outsides. And what I keep doing is cutting it. Right here, that's my interval. Keep cutting, cutting, cutting. What's happening to A and B? In this process, A and B are pinching in on the solution. So I'll tell you what, we'll never actually reach it. We can only get within numerical precision. So what happens if A and B get really close? In fact, why don't I stop if A and B are less than some tolerance? In other words, if the difference between A and B is, let's say, less than 10 to minus 4, that means you've squeezed this down to something within 10 to minus 4. Stop. So let's do that. So now, in our code, we're going to just ask the following question. If B minus A is less than, OK, we'll stop it at 10 minus 6, break. End. So what this is going to do is going to break us out of the loop. And by the way, let's actually have it now print for us what the value of, uh, of A is, which is just as, it's t within 10 to minus 6 of B, and also what J is. That's our whole loop. It's how we write this code. We're going to let this thing go. There. So that minimum occurs. You see the values here? See how fast that was? At negative 1.2742. And it did it in 31 iterations. So it kept squeezing it down. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. Now we're within 10 to minus 6 of each other. And I'd say that's the point. It took 31 iterations to do it. Converges to the solution. Forearm shiver, that thing. Awesome. Uh, so you see, we got minimization problem. And by the way, so. What we just did is we executed this thing on the golden search. 
you would do something very similar to successive parabolic in interpolation. You write a code, you have an if statement here that would tell you move left or right in the boundary, squeeze it down, squeeze it down. Once, you, once your x1 and x3 are so close, that means you've pretty much got the point. Same kind of algorithm. An algorithm like this is actually in the book, in the notes, so you can follow from there. We're going to go ahead, get in, go ahead and stop here and then move on in the next lecture to derivative-based methods for doing optimization.